Basic UAS Flight Training The objective of this training course is to present the basics of flying a drone, including the flight controls, takeoff and landing techniques, factors affecting flight, as well as safety procedures. On completion of this course, you will have learned about standard UAS flight controls, conditions affecting takeoff and landing, ground effects, GPS, global positioning system, and manual control, establishing boundaries, identifying hazards, emergency procedures, visual orientation, checklists, and logging. Download resources for this class include factors affecting takeoff and landing for a UAV, how to fly a quadcopter, the ultimate guide, and logging of unmanned system pilot time. Resources can be downloaded online at thedroneprofessor.com under the Resources menu. The Factors of Flight – Aerodynamics of Unmanned Aerial Vehicles The simplest thing to do is to hover in place. Simple, right? No worries, no problems. What about return to home? Push the button and back it comes. Unless there's something in the way. What if you flew to the other side of a group of people? You certainly don't want a drone in trouble making a beeline across the field from the other side. Better to set it down where it is, if there's a problem. If we're not using a ground station control, that means a manual launch or takeoff. As the propellers start up, they begin to create lift. Near the surface, there's something called ground effect. That's where the air from the propellers bounces back off the ground to create turbulence. With the quadcopter or rotorcraft, the operator needs to lift swiftly out of ground effect. Before we take off, let's take a moment to understand ground effect. Ground effect is a factor in both takeoff and landing for all aircraft, but more about landing. Ground effect has a direct effect on lift because it creates a reduction in both upwash and downwash as the air beneath a wing or propellers is compressed by the proximity to the surface of the ground, which creates a cushion effect. Fixed wing or rotary lift changes in close proximity to the landing surface. Ground effect occurs at a distance above the surface equal to the wingspan. The wingspan of a multirotor is the total width from rotor tip to rotor tip. Here's how we calculate ground effect distance. Taking that into account, always lift off swiftly and smoothly and enter ground effect slowly on landing to avoid bouncing off the ground effect bubble. On a typical quadcopter, that would be about 2 feet. So 10 to 12 feet might be a good spot to hover. Pause at that level and hover in place while you check the information on the screen. Is the battery holding up? Are the satellites still locked into GPS? If the mission is pre-planned with something like ground station, once everything looks good, it's time to initiate the planned or programmed flight. Always be alert to problems, though, and be ready to execute your fail-safe emergency procedure. Then, once the mission is complete, it's time to bring it back for the landing. If you're manually landing, you'll need to again factor in ground effect. Ground effect can be avoided by approaching at a slight angle, generally upwind or downwind. Manually landing too fast can result in a porpoise landing or bouncing, which generally results in a topple over landing and damaged props. The automated landings compute all the variations, but you'll be hard pressed to match the computer. So let's practice a gentle landing. What if we need to bring it down to land in a hurry? Something is coming, we need to get out of the way. Most drones are set to limit the descent speed. There's a reason for that. It's known as the vortex ring effect. Chopper pilots will argue that vortex ring and settling with power may not be exactly the same thing, but give me some space here for educational purposes. VRS cost me one Phantom two. In a quadcopter, if you were to descend too rapidly, the drone could encounter turbulent air beneath the propellers, which could result in a loss of lift due to VRS. The best way to attempt to escape from VRS is to apply full lateral control to exit the turbulent air and hope you still have enough altitude to recover. Remember, do not react by applying power to recover from VRS. It only makes it worse. Of necessity, a propeller develops turbulence under or behind itself. It's moving air. 
Chopper pilots get into trouble in hover when the turbulence reduces lift in what's called settling with power. The natural reaction is to add more power, but that only makes it worse because it creates even more turbulence under the prop. So what is the solution? To stop settling with power, move in any lateral direction. It helps to actually reduce lift power. To avoid the problem, descend at a slight angle from vertical and avoid very rapid descent. Flight controls. We don't just give a 14-year-old a written driver's test and then say, go drive, but somehow that's where we are with drones. Totally unlike every other kind of pilot, there is no flight test or flying experience required like we have for the student pilot, for example. For UAVs, the FAA says, pass this test and go fly. That may change at some point, but for now, the responsibility is totally on the remote pilot. To that point, it's common to see drone pilots operating the controls with their thumbs or fingers, and a lot of longtime flyers prefer that method. However, just as student drivers are instructed in the 10-2 or more recently the 9-3 steering wheel position, there is a better way to begin with the thumb and finger method, and one manufacturer includes that suggestion in their instructions. Even professional operators find themselves slipping into bad habits. But there really is a better way to operate the drone controls. We might describe the second choice as the pinch method. Which method has more precise control? Which is most likely to result in smooth motions and video? For a multi-copter, the left control has two functions. Pushing up and down makes the drone go up or down. Left and right makes the drone spin, left or right. The right control is the directional control, forward, back, left and right. It works by changing the speed of the motors so that when the drone goes forward or back, it pitches forward or back. The propellers speed up, which lifts that side of the drone. This is one reason why hand launching is a bad idea. When a drone is pushed even so slightly, the drone's computer stabilizer brain pushes back by tilting the rotors in the opposite direction. When flying in a circle, you'll coordinate both control sticks together. The coordination part is the trick uh, with any flight technique. Drones, helicopter, winged aircraft, anything. When flying a fixed-wing UAV, you'll need to remember to add lift when you go into a turn. You'll also need to learn to make the turn and return the controls to neutral to prevent a death spiral. Watch the controls. Very subtle and coordinated motions are necessary for flying a circle pattern. Notice how little the controls are actually moving.
Once you begin to develop your flying skills, you can maneuver around and through obstacles. It takes concentration and subtle control action. When flying a fixed wing, the control motions are momentary and not steady. When turning in a bank, continued turn controls will result in a spiral, loss of lift, and some trouble. Let's watch how this works. When you can develop precision flying skills, you can maneuver into difficult places. Remember what we recommend for hand positions, at least until you master the controls. This grip helps you avoid jerky moves and overreactions that can spell trouble. We don't take a 16-year-old, give him a written driver's test and say, here's the keys, go drive, but somehow that's where we are with drones. There is no flight test or required flying experience like we have for a student pilot. The FAA says, pass the test and go fly. That may change, but for now, the responsibility is on the remote pilot. So see what driver's ed for drones might look like. There are several exercises that will help the new operator to gain flying skills. These are roughly based on the patterns and maneuvers a student pilot might practice to gain flying skills in a Cessna or Piper aircraft. Fly the aircraft ahead and back, to the left and back, to the right and back, backward and return to the starting point. Maintain the original altitude. This is an exercise I like to call walking the dog. Fly forward and walk behind, guiding the drone as you walk in different directions, following the aircraft. It helps you to become familiar with the controls and respond to conditions. In most of the newer drones, the controller seems to know which way the drone is facing. That's sometimes called headless mode. Push the control to the left and that's where it goes, regardless of where it's aimed. But we need to acquire enough skill as an operator to be more than a push-button pilot. We need to develop skills so that we can fly safely without that feature. In manual mode, turning the drone 90 degrees turns the controls 90 degrees as well, so left is no longer left. Our flight simulator helps you develop better situational awareness like that. A good practice is to turn the drone and then fly a pattern, like a box, and learn to adjust to any orientation. Here's an exercise in visual orientation. Turn the aircraft to face in the direction of travel and repeat the box pattern. Then repeat the pattern in the opposite direction. Now we'll combine these first two maneuvers with a simple box pattern flying left, forward, right, back and returning to the starting point completing the box pattern. Rotation. From a hover position, let's say 50 feet, rotate the aircraft and continue around a circle to the left. How do you do that? You'll want to push the left control slightly to the left while moving the right control forward. That way the drone moves forward and to the left, completing the circle. That's what we might call a coordinated turn, meaning we need to coordinate the left and right controls. Turns in any aircraft create a loss of altitude, so we may need to adjust to compensate for that. Turning on a point's a little more complicated. Begin a sweeping turn making an arc of about 30 feet, this time maintaining the front of the aircraft toward the center of the circle. Repeat in the opposite direction until you're comfortable with the routine. Again, coordinate the controls to maintain the desired motion and altitude. The next step from a simple circle is two circles. We call that complex turns. Select a straight line, for example, a fence line, then fly a figure S with the aircraft pointing in the direction of travel. Account for wind drift, if any, and continue to repeat until you can achieve a smooth S pattern. 
One thing that can mess with any aircraft landing is wind, a crosswind. One way to address severe winds on landing is to land downwind with the GPS turned off. We call that manual or ATTI mode. Why would you want to turn off GPS on landing? To prevent the GPS from counteracting the wind drift and tilting the UAV, which can cause the old flop over landing. One way to address a crosswind landing is to land downwind with the GPS turned off, manual or ATTI mode, to prevent the GPS from countering the wind drift and tilting the UAV. Practice landing on a target or landing pad to sharpen your skills. The landing pad also prevents sand and dust from being thrown up into the motors and reduces grass stains on the propellers. Remember to take off swiftly and land gently. On completion of your flight practice, you should be able to demonstrate a takeoff and hover, avoiding ground effect, demonstrating a downwind landing, demonstrating a pattern flight, the box, the turn on a point, the S-turn, performing a return to home, as in a lost link, and generate a sample operation plan. Launch operations. How do you plan a drone flight? What are the factors to consider before you get off the ground? You'll need to check a few things first. Check the weather, winds, fronts. That's part of risk management. Rule of thumb, experienced pilots, 50% of the max forward speed of the aircraft. Verify your location, identify the airspace, proximity to restricted areas, airports, and so on. Check TFRs, temporary flight restrictions, at tfr.faa.gov. Use apps to check the location for TFRs and NOTAMs. Check for obstacles, power lines, highways, magnetic fields, and so on. Check your compass calibration. If you're over 50 miles from the last flight, when required for the model used, you might need to recheck. GPS. Six satellites is the usual minimum. Eight is preferred. Set and mark the boundaries with your visual observer. Maintain a sterile cockpit throughout the complete flight operation. Beware of metal under the launch point, like concrete with rebar. Do not launch from a surface containing metal such as reinforced concrete or a location with strong magnetic fields such as near pool pumps or motors or the roof of a squad car, which interfere with compass calibration and GPS. Instead, use a metal-free, dust-free location or use a launching pad, which can be as simple as a piece of cardboard or a yoga mat or even a car floor mat. This is a flight training lesson, but in the field, don't separate the flight practice from pre-flight and mission planning. No matter where you fly for practice, you still need to check the location, the weather, no temps, pre-flight checklist, and inspection, and have your documentation handy, either physical or digital. Even in your own backyard, you may need to check for no temps. I live under a military operational area, or MOA. 99% of the time, there's nothing going on. Other times, it's closed. Once in a while, I might turn on an app and see special use airspace unavailable, operations restricted. Special use airspace is relatively new. Temporary restricted area notices are issued under a SOA menu tab at the tfr.faa.gov website. By the way, the screen example is on Verifly. Verifly is cost-effective if you're only flying once a week. After you reach maybe 40 or 50 flights at $10 to $25 for each hour, it's better to look for annual coverage. For any flight, you need to remember to determine your flight goals, establish launch area boundaries, and note any obstacles or hazards. Whether it's a local park or your own backyard, what kind of hazards do we need to be aware of? Power lines? Trees? How about terrain? Why? Unexpected air currents can come around buildings or over hills. What about weather fronts, air currents like downdrafts, quick changes in wind direction as fronts pass? This is what a weather front looks like. Downdrifts can appear miles ahead of the edge of the cloud formation. Pre-flight. Charge the main batteries, check for charge, wear or damage since the last use. Check motors, spin them around. Check the props for wear. Check spare props, do you have any? Check for wind with an anemometer. Check your radio, is it charged? Inspect the airframe for cracks and damage from previous flights. Develop your own specific checklist for planning the mission, the pre-flight, post-flight and maintenance. Why the pre-flight inspection? Here's a sample of a DJI Phantom 3 that developed small cracks around the motor mounting screws. After takeoff, the crack got worse and the motor took off on its own. Quadcopters don't fly on three motors, so down it came. Develop your pre-flight, flight, and post-flight checklist specific to each aircraft. Here's a sample checklist for a DJI Inspire. When flight crews performed routine checks over long periods of time without discovering any problems, they may begin to regard such checks as less important. 
This gradual divergence from the checklist is known as procedural drift. You run into that in your job, I'm sure. Do something over and over in your routine, and you're attempted to take shortcuts. There have been plane crashes because somebody skipped something in the checklist or didn't listen to the answer from the cockpit. Gear down? Negative. Okay. Uh, wait, what was that? For the UAS, logs should include the date, time of the start and the end of the flight, the location, the launch site address or coordinates, the aircraft being used, the weather conditions or wind, maximum altitude, the pilot in command or operator and visual observer, loss of control, damage, maintenance needed, and so on. Additional items to log include the number of satellites. Remember, we want a minimum of four, or better, six. The battery ID and the charge status. Checking the home lock setting. The flight purpose, video, photo, practice, testing, whatever. Maintenance and battery charging log. Develop your emergency procedures before any emergency. Battery warning, return to home or land. Intrusion into the launch area, hover, return to home or land. Unexpected wind conditions, decide whether you want to return to home or land. Unexpected low altitude aircraft, return to home or land. Aircraft vibration, maybe from a damaged prop, do you want to return to home or land. Loss of GPS signals, switch to manual mode. DJI Phantom 2, for example, if less than six satellites are found for more than 20 seconds, the aircraft will descend automatically, perhaps when you don't expect it and don't have time for a what the heck reaction time. So expect the unexpected. GPS outages can occur due to sunspots or other causes such as military testing. Here's an example of a notice of GPS interference. What do you do? Learn to switch to manual mode. Manual control is difficult to master, so practice flying under manual control. The key to flying by remote control is visual orientation. Loss of visual orientation often results in C-fit, controlled flight into terrain, or more appropriately for drones, controlled flight into trees. Visual orientation is a specific kind of situational awareness. The best way to overcome the dangers of losing visual orientation is to watch the nose. The best way to avoid visual orientation problems is practice. FPV, first person view, may seem a solution, but FPV reduces situational awareness. A visual observer may partially compensate for the loss of FPV situational awareness. One important thing to consider is the matter of distance perception. When we use simulator training, the first thing we have trouble with is figuring out where the drone is with respect to an obstacle. While in real life you have two eyes, it's not that much better. Trees have a habit of not being where you thought they were. Image may be closer than it appears. So gaining that skill is a matter of practice, whether on the simulator or in the field. Don't be discouraged. The nice thing about the simulator is you can hit reset and you don't have to replace any parts. Let's remember the basics. Stay clear of aircraft whenever props are turning, before and after flight. Check for obstructions and hazards like power lines and so on. Avoid takeoff or landing on grass or sand. Do not take off or launch whenever outside people are near the aircraft. Stop the flight when unauthorized persons enter the restricted area. Do not fly over 400 feet. Do not fly over or within 50 feet of active roadways. Do not fly over people not involved in the flight. Observe other restrictions, airports, major sports events, national parks. Maintain a flight log, date, time, location, max altitude, flight duration, operator name, visual observer name and comments, and so on. Location. Identify the launch location on a sectional map or mobile app to be sure there are no restrictions. Check the weather, check NOTAMs and TFRs, make sure you have a flight plan and any COA or letter of agreement documents you need to have along. Communication. Establish communications with the visual observer and monitor radio traffic where it's required. GPS landing. In a calm wind, take off briskly but not too quickly and hover at twice ground effect altitude above the intended landing point. That's about four to six feet. Then slowly reduce power to a gentle landing and shut off the motors. Next, turn the motors back on and repeat until you have completed at least three successive smooth landings. Manual landing practice without GPS. Determine the wind direction and approach the landing pad downwind. Turn off GPS or set to ATTI or manual mode. Hover at double ground effect level at a 45 degree angle upwind from the intended landing point. Then slowly allow the aircraft to glide toward the landing point. Shut off the motors on touchdown. 
Then turn the motors back on and repeat until you have achieved three successive smooth landings. Why? Because GPS is not a constant. From time to time, GPS may not be available due to government testing, interference, and other signal issues. So you need to know how to operate without the benefit of GPS. On many drones, there's a switch to select between GPS lock or home or ground lock. We know how GPS works, but how does course lock work? In course lock, the controls operate independent of the direction of the aircraft, while in GPS mode, the direction of travel is directly related to the direction the aircraft is facing. Newer drones come with that feature as the default to prevent problems related to loss of situational awareness. However, course lock does not function within 50 feet of the control point. So that means upon approach to landing, you'll want to revert to GPS or manual control mode. Orientation course lock practice. Find a location with about 50 feet in which to maneuver. Lift off to about 40 feet, then fly the aircraft over 50 feet forward. Turn on course lock and turn the aircraft 90 degrees. Operate the left control on the right control stick and you'll see the drone moves to the left of the initial course rather than the way the drone is facing. Repeat to the right. Return to the center of the original course and then fly a course back to the point of takeoff. Again, rotate the aircraft and fly to the left or right. Now that the drone is within 50 feet of the control point, the drone now moves in the direction it's facing. Emergency Procedures Testing Fail-Safe Operation Launch to between 50 and 100 feet up then fly 100 feet away from the operator location, in an area with no obstructions. Turn off the control and the aircraft should return to the launch location and descend to a landing on its own. Keep in mind that in many cases the return to land by GPS is plus or minus from 6 to 20 feet, or maybe more. So give yourself some safety room and be prepared to take over the landing in case wind or other factors make it look like it's not going to land where it should. Here are some of the acronyms that you should become familiar with. UAS, Unmanned Aerial System. UAV, Unmanned Aerial Vehicle, the drone. RPA, Remotely Piloted Aircraft. ATC, Air Traffic Control. COA, a Certificate of Authorization. Fixed Base Operator. NM means Nautical Miles but SM means statute miles. TFR, temporary flight restriction. TRA, temporary restricted area. That's a new term they recently added. We also need to add SUA, special use airspace, which relates to the TRA or temporary restricted area notices. And NOTAM, a notice to airmen. What is ATC? Air traffic control. What is FBO? It's fixed based operator. What is UAS? Unmanned Aerial System. What is a COA? Certificate of Authorization. What is NM? Nautical Miles. And SM? Statute Miles. What about geofencing? In response to concerns expressed by some in government, some manufacturers, specifically DJI, include that function which is designed to prevent drone operators from accidentally flying where they don't belong. But if you're a first responder or a professional drone pilot, you may need to operate in those areas. That's a particular concern for operations near or in restricted areas, airports, or forest fires. DJI provides a means of overriding the geofence function, and here's how it works. Hi, I'm Avery and you're watching DJI Tutorials. In this video, I'll show you how to unlock special zones in DJI's Geo system. DJI's Geospatial Environment Online Geo, provides you with important safety information at the time you fly, and in some cases will automatically restrict your ability to fly in areas that raise serious safety or security concerns. The Geo system includes permanent areas like airports and nuclear power plants, as well as live updated information on temporary restrictions such as forest fires or major stadium events. It's important to note that the GEO system is advisory only. You're responsible for checking official sources for any laws or regulations that may apply to your flight. In some instances, DJI has selected widely recommended general parameters, like a 1.5 mile radius at airports, 
without confirming regulations that may apply specifically to you. Getting into the geosystem itself, there are three color-coded zones on the map. Green, yellow, and red. Green stands for warning or enhanced warning zones. In these areas, you'll simply get a notification before flying, letting you know that you may be in a sensitive area. If it's an enhanced warning zone, you'll be prompted to acknowledge it. You don't need to take any special steps within the app itself, just be mindful of potential hazards and consider double-checking the regulations. Yellow means you're in an authorization zone. In these areas, certain aspects of your flight may be limited by default, but there's a way to unlock that restriction on your own if you're authorized to fly there. There are two ways to unlock an authorization zone, and both require a DJI account verified with a credit card, debit card, or phone number, though verification is free. If you have internet connection where you're flying, you can use the DJI GO app on-site for immediate unlocking of a yellow authorization zone. If you're going to be flying somewhere that you might not have an internet connection, you should unlock the area beforehand with DJI's Flight Planner on the DJI GEO website. To unlock authorization zones with the DJI GO app on-site, you must have an internet connection and all updated firmware. When your aircraft approaches an authorization zone, or is already within one, you'll be prompted with a warning and the opportunity to unlock the zone. Follow the prompt to acknowledge that you received the information. If you're logged in with a verified account, you'll be able to unlock the zone immediately. The unlock will last for 24 hours with this method and can be renewed after. To unlock authorization zones in advance with the flight planner off-site, go to this page and scroll down to the bottom. Enter the date you want to unlock, your flight controller's serial number, which is found in the DJI GO app under General Settings, About, and click Submit. You'll need to confirm your authorization here using a credit card or phone number and enter the corresponding information. You'll get an immediate approval here, and you can then go back to unlink more zones or view your account. Your unlock will last for 72 hours with this method, starting at midnight of your chosen date and can be renewed after. With this method, you can unlock up to 30 authorization zones at a time and can run them together in case you need a longer period of time, such as if you're traveling. And remember, you only need to use this method if you're going to be flying in an area where you won't have internet connection. The third color, red, means you're in a restricted zone. These areas, which correspond to areas with serious safety or security issues, have a flight restriction built into the drone stopping you from flying. If you are authorized to fly in one of these locations, we're happy to enable flight with a custom solution. Go to this page and fill in the requested information. You'll need to identify your organization and provide documentation of your authorization to fly in the designated areas. Examples of such documentation include a certificate of authorization, operating license or permit from a national aviation authority, a letter of agreement with an airport, a statement of work from a facility that has hired you for the operation, etc. When finished, submit the application, then read and agree to the terms and conditions. We work to process your custom unlocking request within five business days. If any part of your request is incomplete or missing, it will result in a delay. This website form is only available in certain regions. If it's not available in your area, please email flysafe at dji.com with your request instead. If your custom unlocking request is approved, you'll get an email prompting you to go into the DJI GO app and click General Settings, Unlock. Once there, you'll click Synchronize Unlock Information, reconfirm your authorization, and unlock the approved locations. It's important to note that unlocking your aircraft with a custom unlocking solution may disable certain features like waypoint navigation, so plan to fly your equipment manually. 
Remember, every user is responsible for checking official sources and determining what flight restrictions may apply to an area at the time of flight. At DJI, we're working to keep everyone safe while flying, and we're happy to help when you have special authorizations. Your next task is to find a place to practice flying. Create an operational plan. Select a flight location. Select a flight date and check the weather. Check for NOTAMs and TFRs and TRAs. Identify airport and restricted areas. Complete a sample flight mission plan. Download resources include factors affecting takeoff and landing for UAV, how to fly a quadcopter, the ultimate guide, and logging of unmanned system pilot time. Ground effects is discussed in some detail in the ebook Building Multicopter Video Drones by Ty Adronis at Amazon.com. Paul Cantrell at Copters.com provides a good discussion of ground effect as it applies to helicopters and conversely drones. Another good resource is my FAA 107 UAG Remote Pilot Study Guide, available in print and ebook form from Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Smashwords, and other book sources. This has been Basic Flight Instruction for Drones. I hope the instruction was useful. For more training videos, visit thedroneprofessor.com. And remember to always fly safe. Thank you.